All right, welcome everyone. You know, uh, it, it blows my mind to say this, but we are already done with the first month of this school year. So the old saying goes, time flies when you're having fun. I don't really know how much fun you're having, but I do know that the time is still flying. If you are a person who does not yet have your member blog set up and on the member blogs roster, in other words, if when you go on this tab on the course blog, if you don't see your name and your course blog here, please, 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 please do not get off this Zoom meeting today without letting me help you get that set up. Remember, if I can't see what you're posting, it's like you're not posting anything at all because I can't give you the feedback to help you improve and you and I both won't know how you're doing in the course. So, number one, please make sure that we get that done by the end of the day's Zoom call. Number two, please make sure that you have a notebook where you're writing your daily journal entries. Starting next week, I may send you an email or get in touch and say, I'd love to see the entry from and I'll pick the day. Or I might ask you to select your best two or three and to put them on your course blog or email them to me so that I can read them. Because again, we write every single day as an effort to get better. If we're practicing, we're getting better. And sometimes the feedback that comes from practice is just as helpful. So I wanna be able to have those conversations with you. So the blog, the notebook. The third thing that you really need to have by this week and I realize that it's tough because in this class, we don't meet each week until Friday. So you need to have a routine that you can sustain on your time in between these Zoom meetings. So that routine should involve three parts. Number one, it should involve checking the course blog. Now, some of you have figured out, well, actually hardly anybody has figured out, that you can follow the course blog simply by entering your email address, if you look at my cursor, in the follow by email box. If you do that, then every time I put something new on the course blog, like when I put the daily agenda up, it will come to you as an email message saying there's a new post on the course blog and it's time to check. If you don't do that, it's your choice, but then you do need to remember to check the course blog at least once a day. After you've checked the course blog and you see the agenda, you know what's expected, then it's time to read or write or do the work that we agree to. Then claim your credit. Don't forget that we have a Google Sheet for this period that lives right in the tab that says Sheets. And at a glance, if you go to period seven, you can easily see who's crushing it and who's got some work to do. So with that being said, make sure that now that we're in period seven, week four, heading into the second month already of the school year, make sure that you've got those three things, your blog, your notebook, and a routine. Now, I know that some people are really struggling with the beginning of the school year. And ordinarily, I'd be up in it with you in the classroom and I'd say, come on, it's time to get going. We've been at this for three and a half weeks. Where's your course blog? I still feel a little bit that way because we did make some pretty obvious agreements in week one, and it's not that hard to do. But I'm not out to judge anybody, especially this year. And I really want you to know, wherever you are in this process, I am absolutely dedicated to helping you succeed in this course. No one has to fail. Even if you haven't gotten this done yet, there's a lot of time in front of us, and I want to work with you to make sure that you're successful. So. I do wanna go over a couple of things from last week. If you're hearing these things and just privately going, oh man, I don't even know where to start, don't panic. I'm here for you, all right? Here's what happened last week. I assigned an essay and we agreed on the Hack to School Night video. Some people did a great job and I'm still reading those to give you feedback. But some of you haven't done it yet. If you haven't done it yet, please do it this weekend. In some classes, you'll have a teacher who gives a due date, and after that due date, the work doesn't count. Again, it makes it harder if the work is done afterward. I do believe in being responsible and being accountable, and I do want you to get your work done on time. 
But right now, there are more important things. Right now, there's the value of trusting each other and helping each other and being kind to each other. So I really want to let you know that if you didn't do the essay yet, it still matters that you're trying to do the essay. And I still care about you and I will still read it and I will still give you feedback. If you missed last week's Zoom call, and I'm gonna click on this because the first thing that I asked you to do this week was to comment on my essay. It might strike you as weird though if you weren't on last week's Zoom call, why did the teacher write an essay? Well, because I promised I would. I told everyone in our Zoom meeting last week that I would do the work along with you. So below is my attempt. Now, if you were with us on Zoom last week, you know that the word essay originally comes from the French word that means to try, to attempt something. So I'd be grateful if you took a few moments to read this. I did a pre-write and I wrote a draft. And I'm not just looking for compliments. I mean, on the one hand, I'm a writer, which means I write. But that doesn't make me think it's easy. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It makes me realize every single day just how challenging the act of writing really is. So every writer wants feedback. If I do something well, yeah, I'd love to know about it. But at the same time, if there was something that you think could be better, I would love to know that too. I mean, look, my own wife read this and said, you could have ended it a few paragraphs sooner. Ooh. Okay, great. I want to know how I can make it better for you too. That kind of feedback helps us all improve. Some of you may have noticed that there aren't any grades on Aries gradebook, and there aren't going to be. Because when I get a paper back from someone, I don't know how this is for you, but if I give you feedback on your work and I say, uh, hey Russ, you know what? The way that you linked your ideas together made them flow really nicely, and I felt like I understood everything without even trying that hard. That's good feedback. Or if I say, wow, you know what? Your figurative language, the comparisons that you make really painted a picture in my mind, and I felt like I was right there with you. Those kinds of feedback help me understand what I'm doing well as a writer. If I just hold a paper up and I say, this is a B minus, I don't know how that helps. Now, I know that people like to follow along the scoreboard. They like to see what's going on. It's the same thing as with back to school night. So if you or your parents ever have a question about how you're doing in the course, it's the same thing as getting help. All you have to do is ask. I like to provide the kind of feedback that people feel like they are getting the best customer service on the planet. So if you or your parents ever reach out for a grade question, it's the same thing to me as a help question. I always answer within 24 hours. I'll meet you on Zoom if you wanna schedule a Zoom meeting. We'll have an email exchange if you prefer to do it that way. But you always deserve to know exactly where you stand. And right now I'm catching up because I'm trying to read all these uh, essays. So if you wanna know something, all you gotta do is ask. Before I go on, I want to know if that's clear. Does anybody have any questions about why I don't use gradebook or how we're gonna give each other feedback or what I'm asking you on this essay? Anybody have questions at all? Okay, if you think of something later, let me know. I'm gonna head back to the agenda now. And, oops, I just realized I'm on the wrong course blog, but it's the same, up until that point it was the same. Oh no, I was the right course blog. I'm psyching myself out. <laughs> okay, so job number one this week was to catch up on work. And like I said in the beginning, and I'll repeat this a few times, I'll help people with their blogs and catch up at the end of today's Zoom meeting. The second thing was to comment on my essay. So please read that and comment. The third thing for this week is to watch the video I put up on symbolism and answer the questions below it in a post on your blog. So this link goes right up top to this page, meaning signs and symbols. When I click on it, I see there's a video and then there's five questions. Your job is to watch the video and answer the five questions. And now I'd like to give you a choice. We can either bookmark this and say it's homework. Well, I mean, all your whole life is homework, but that we'll do it independently. Or 
If you'd prefer, we can watch the video right now together, and that way if you have any questions, you can ask me. So I'll go with the first voice or the first vote that I hear or see. What would you like to do? Watch it together. You're on, winner. Okay, so this video is about nine minutes long. If you already have a blog and you wanna open a post, you know that you're gonna to need to do a blog post, so you may as well type it right in when you hear the answers, or you can take notes on paper. And paper reminds me of something. You know, I kinda of wanna interrupt myself really quickly, and I'm gonna come back to this in a second, but I do wanna show you one more quick thing I put on the blog. This last weekend, I realized that some people really like writing their essays on paper. And I support that for a lot of good reasons. If you're a person who wants to write on paper and then put something on your blog, there's a better way to do that than taking a picture. This is a pretty clear picture of a book page, but as you can see, there's ink coming through from behind, there's shadows and texture, and it doesn't look nearly as clean as this. Now this is the same page from the same book, but what I've done, and when I blow it up, you can see it even more clearly. And you can post things on your blog that look just like this. So what I've done is I created a how-to for you. All of this is free and super easy to use. This is 10 steps. Every step has a screenshot. But if you're a person who wants to write things on paper and then turn them in on your blog that way, this is gonna really help you. For today, if you wanna take notes on the video on paper, that's fine. Otherwise, you can open a blog post and we'll go ahead and play it now. Here we go. If you have your mic open, will you go ahead and mute that, please? Because we're getting some ambient noise. Great, thanks. All right, here's the video. Hi, I'm David Preston, and you're watching part one of Meanings, Signs, and Symbols. The important thing to understand about meanings, signs, and symbols is that they're everywhere. We'll talk in part two about the difference in definitions between a symbol and a sign. But right now, what you need to know is that there are all sorts of messages being intentionally put everywhere around your field of vision so that you can see and understand what other people want you to think. That can mean an ad banner when you surf the internet. That can be a billboard where you drive. It can be the newspaper that lands on your neighbor's driveway. It can be something in a textbook in school. Everywhere around you, people have created symbols designed to persuade, inform, and entertain you in ways that you may not even be aware of. And unless you can look past the things that are designed to distract you from paying attention, you won't get the full meaning. Now, whether you're in one of my classes or not, if you're watching this and you have any questions along the way or you'd like more information, please feel free to email me at dpreston.learning at gmail.com. You know, I first started thinking about meaning signs and symbols when I was in high school, and I was reading a book called The Great Gatsby with a teacher of mine. Now, what I didn't realize at the time was that The Great Gatsby wasn't just the story as it was being told by the narrator. I mean, sure, guy falls in love with a girl. Girl seems to fall in love with a guy, maybe, we're not really sure. Guy does everything to try and make her love him buys a nice house, buys great cars, makes lots of money, has these amazing parties just to get her attention and be the kind of person that might deserve her affection. Well, to any guy in high school, okay, so what was supposed to be the deeper meaning? Why was my teacher saying that this was such a great book? Well, it was because of the deeper meanings that were in the symbols all around us like the green light at the end of Daisy's dock. My friends and I didn't agree that that was so valuable. In fact, we sat around thinking like, well, okay, so it's a dock. We see the water. We know that Gatsby's house is across the water. We know that he sees it. Other than knowing that's where Daisy lives, what's it supposed to be? Is it supposed to be the color of money? Is it like Shakespeare said, you know, that you should be green with envy? Or is it something different, like green light means go and that Gatsby should take a chance and like make a play for the love of his life? It turned out that 
the actual meaning was less important than the conversations we were having about the meaning. You know, different people can read a book and because we all have different lived experiences, different feelings, different memories, we can take different things from the text and we can have a disagreement about it and actually see it in different ways and be right. You can also read a book at one point in your life and then come back to it later on after you've had different kinds of experiences and go, oh, oh, wow. Which is some of what happened for me when I came back to teach. When I read as a student, I did enough to get the paper done. I did enough to get the grade. But I didn't really understand like what Hamlet is going through his to be or not to be moment. Like a lot of people, I just thought he was a moody teenager with a decision-making disorder. I didn't really appreciate the fact that Hamlet made up his mind to kill his uncle from the beginning of the book or the play. And yet there's a lot that goes into those kinds of decisions that maybe we don't appreciate until we've had some experiences of our own. So back to the green light, back to Gatsby wanting Daisy to fall in love with him. That's a pretty basic instinct. That's a pretty basic impulse or drive that people have. And one of the things that came up was that when Charles Darwin wrote origin of species and gave us the idea of evolution. People became aware of the fact that human beings actually have a lot in common with lots of animals. We are now called the thinking or the tool using animal by a lot of people. And after all, we're born, we eat, we sleep, we relieve ourselves, we mate, we die, we give birth, just like a lot of other animals. In fact, even our use of language isn't all that unique. So many other animals communicate through language. You can go outside and listen to the birds and the trees. We're not that special in that way. But it turns out there is one thing that human beings do that hardly any other animal does. This is a wonderful book called Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. And in this book, we learn that, first of all, there were lots of different kinds of hominids. There were Neanderthals, there were Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Denisovians. But Homo sapiens did something different. We weren't the strongest. We didn't necessarily have the best location on the planet to use as a powerful lever. But we told stories. We invented ideas that didn't actually exist as a physical thing in the world that we could verify with our senses, but we knew those ideas to be true anyway. And those ideas allowed us to share meaning. Now this becomes important because most species, even human beings, don't normally organize in numbers much greater than about 150. This is called the Dunbar number. The Dunbar number is important. Schools are arranged around it. Even high school teachers who teach five, six periods a day don't normally have much more than 150, 180 students, because after that number, it's really hard to tell who belongs in the group and how to communicate with them in a personal way. The military is also arranged around the Dunbar number. But when human beings started inventing these stories, we could organize in numbers far greater. Even language is limited. Language, even if it's English, even if it's in the United States, differs from place to place. You can hear the difference between a West Texas drawl and an East Texas twang. The Massachusetts people who don't pronounce their eyes. Or you talk to a New Yorker who doesn't talk like an Italian. I mean, you've got all of these different accents and ways of being, and that's just in one language in one country. When you go to a different country and you don't speak the language, you're at a disadvantage. Hay muchas palabras en español que no me recuerdo porque no practico bastante. But I'm not really fluent in Spanish. I have to think about it in English and translate it into my mind. So when I have a student who's learning to read in English and trying to translate it into Spanish, I recognize that there are some extra steps. But back to symbols for a minute. Human beings did something that takes care of that whole problem. If you see an American flag, it doesn't matter which language you speak, you recognize that that's the national symbol for the United States of America. If you belong to a certain religion, Catholicism or Islam, for example, you can go anywhere in the world and you can see the rituals being done 
in whatever language the host practices, that you don't have to know the language to know the prayers or when to stand up or when to sit down or how to indicate that you believe the same things and that you are one of us, whoever the us is. The same is true if you're a Green Bay Packers fan or a Manchester United fan. You can go anywhere in the world with those team colors, and the people who know will know by the millions. Now that becomes important because once we share story, once we share the meaning of symbols, well then we can organize in far greater numbers and everything becomes possible. Next time in part two, we'll talk about the specific definition of a symbol and how to recognize symbols in the stories we tell so that we can get to the deeper meaning that lies beyond. Thanks for watching. See you next time. All right. So first of all, I got to tell you how weird it is to sit here and watch me talk while I'm also watching me on Zoom while I'm chatting with you. It's, it's bizarre. <laughs> but while it's fresh, what questions do you have about this? Were the questions that I was asking fairly straightforward? Or is there anything that you'd like to know before we move on? awfully quiet today. Can I get a thumbs up or something? We're good. Okay, thanks, Jasmine. All right, so then let's switch gears. And as always, if for whatever reason, a question comes to you later, or you're wondering why this is important or how it's going to matter as we read things, let me know because I want to make sure that you feel confident that you have the information you need to succeed. So if we go back to this week's agendas, The next item on our list was thinking about a story together. Now, this is where we're going to start to sink our teeth into some of the storytelling tradition that leads up to what we might call American literature. I don't think people give a whole lot of thought to what they mean when they say American or when they say the word literature. So let's talk about both for a quick second. Americans are a pretty widely diverse group of people, and some would define it by where a person is born. Some would define it by a person's DNA or cultural heritage. I like to define American by who shows up right now and who claims themselves to be an American, because I don't have a better definition. I look at the way that the government defines it, and it makes me sick. I look at the way that People use labels like this to define who's in the group and who's outside the group. And it makes no sense to me. To me, a person is American if they're around in this point in history, around this time, around this place, and they say so, because what better do I know? But American has a certain connotation to a lot of people. It's a certain way of being, it's a certain culture, and most importantly, it's a certain style of storytelling. And at this point in history, a lot of people identify that with Hollywood and movie-based storytelling. But before there was a movie-based storytelling, there was a, also a literature that came in writing. And before there was a literature that came in writing, there was a literature that was shared in stories that people told each other. And if we go way back, before the colonists, before all of the waves of immigration to the original immigrants who probably came over the Bering Strait, the land bridge from Asia to Alaska, we're talking about the Native Americans. And one of the earliest stories we have that's available to us in this year's curriculum is called The Earth on Turtle's Back. Now this would have been the story that people told their children, that people shared in their tribe, and I say the word tribe, we should also be careful and intentional because when we say Native American, we're talking about lots of different types of groups of people. You know, if we say American now, well, you know, a MAGA cap wearing American in Oklahoma is a whole lot different than a American of a different mindset who lives in California or Massachusetts or Texas or Maine or Oregon. So, just as that's true, the Native Americans who lived here a long time didn't necessarily all think the same way, speak the same language, etc. 
So this comes to us from the Onondaga Northeast Woodlands Tribe. And the story is called The Earth on Turtle's Back. Now, I don't know about you, but every once in a while I get nostalgic for doing things in person. And one of the things I always like to do when we read is, you know that old thing like popcorn reading where one person reads and then feels complete. And so they pick somebody else to pick up where they left off. And that's what I'm gonna ask us to do today. I'll go ahead and start and then I'll pick somebody. You then read when you feel complete, wherever that is, you can say popcorn and pick the next person. So I'll start, here we go. Before this earth existed, there was only water. It stretched as far as one could see. And in that water, there were birds and animals swimming around. Far above in the clouds, there was a skyland. In that skyland, there was a great and beautiful tree. It had four white roots, which stretched to each of the sacred directions. And from its branches, all kinds of fruits and flowers grew. All right, popcorn, crystal. There was an ancient chief in Skyland. His young wife was expecting a child. And one night she dreamed that she saw the great tree uprooted. The next morning she, t she told her husband the story. Do I keep going? You can be complete whenever you like. Oh. <laughs> Um, Popcorn Hugo. He nodded as she finished telling her dream. My wife, he said, I am sad that you had this dream. It is clearly a dream of great power. And as is our way, when one has such a powerful dream, we must do all that we can to make it true. The great tree must be uprooted. Popcorn. Uh, Russ. Uh, where at? Okay, see my cursor? Then. Then the ancient. Then the, the ancient chief. Called the. The young men together and told them that they must pull up the tree. Is it cool if, if I just read that one line? Yeah, I guess so, but it would be cooler if you read the whole paragraph. Uh, uh, popcorn, George. But the roots of the tree were so deep, so strong, that they could not budge it. At least the ancient chief himself came to the tree. He wrapped his arms around it, bent his knees, and strained. At last, which, with one great effort, he up, uprooted the tree and placed it on its side. Where the tree's roots had gone deep into the skyland, there was a big hole. The wife of the chief came close and leaned over to look down, uh, grasped the tips of one of the great tree's branches to steady her. It seemed as if she saw something down there far below, glittering like water. She, she leaned out further to look and she, as she leaned, she lost her balance and fell into the hole. Her grasp slipped off the tip of the branch, leaving her with only a handful of seeds as she fell down, down, down. Um, popcorn Raymond. Which part are we at? Ray, we'll be more below. Far below in the waters, some of the birds and animals look. Uh, someone is falling toward, toward us from the sky, said one of the birds. We must do something to help her, said another. Then two swans flew up. They caught the woman from the sky between their wide wings. Slowly they began to bring her down toward the water where the birds and animals were watching. She is not like us, said one of the animals. <laughs> Look, she doesn't have web feet. I don't think she can live in the water. What shall we do then, said one, another of the water animals. 
I know, said one of the water birds. I've heard that there's a That's funky. Can you hear us, Ray? If we dive down and bring up Earth, then she will have a place to stand. All right, call popcorn. Yeah. You're creeping us out. Right about that. Okay, Ray, I'm not sure what's happening with your microphone, so I'm going to take over and then I'll call popcorn from here, okay? I don't know who else there is. Okay, that's all right. I'll do it. I know, said one of the water birds. I have heard that there is earth far below the waters. If we dive down and bring up to earth, then she will have a place to stand. So the birds and the animals decided that someone would have to bring up earth. One by one, they tried. The duck dove down first, some say. He swam down and down far beneath the surface, but could not reach the bottom and floated back up. Then the beaver tried. He went even deeper, so deep that it was all dark, but he could not reach the bottom either. The loon tried, swimming with his strong wings. He was gone a long, long time, but he too failed to bring up earth. Soon, it seemed that all had tried and all had failed. Then a small voice spoke up. Popcorn, Fabian. <clears throat> um, I will bring up Earth and die trying. They looked to see who it was. It was a tiny muskrat. Uh, she drove down the swamp and swamp. She was not strong, as strong as swift as the others, as the other, but she was determined. She went to sleep. She went so deep. She went to. She went so deep. It, that it was all dark and still she swam deeper. She went so deep that her lungs felt ready to burst, but she swam deeper still at last. Just as she was becoming unconscious, she reached out one small paw and grasped at the bottom, barely touching it before she floated up, almost dead. Do I read more? It's up to you. You can keep going or you can call somebody else. All right. Um, when the other animals saw her break the surface, they thought she had failed. Then they saw her right paw was held tightly shut. She has the earth, they said. Now where can we put it? Place it on my back, said a deep voice. It was the great turtle who had come up from the depths. They brought the muskrat over to the great turtles and placed her paw against his back. To this day, there are marks marks at the back of the turtle shell, which were made by the muskrat paw. The tiny bit of earth fell on the back of the turtle almost immediately. It began growing larger and larger and larger until it became the whole world. Then the two swans brought the sky woman down. She stepped onto the earth and open her hands, letting the seeds fall into the bare soil. From those seeds, the trees and grass sprang up life on earth and as began, begun. Thank you, Fabian. So I really appreciate the fact that everybody who read did it willingly and did it well. And Fabian, I especially want to thank you because you made a choice there toward the end and I want to ask you about it because you said, do I have to keep reading? Now, normally when I get that question from students, they're basically saying, can I please be done? And I gave you the choice, like I always give a student, but then you decided to keep going. And I'm wondering why. <clears throat> I don't know. I always do that because I wasn't paying attention. All right. <laughs> I like it. Well, yeah, my bad. I don't know. It's cool. It's all good with me. But what I like about it was that you like, you want to, what I felt was, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, because I'm guessing, I can't see you. But what I'm feeling was that like, you wanted to make it right and do it better. And you were going to keep going until you got it done. Was that kind of where you were coming from? Yeah, so I could make up for the, um, I wasn't paying attention. All right. Well, as of right now, you and I are friends, because I love people like that in my life. But think about this. 
where you started reading, I mean, you're basically reading like a 50 cent lyric, right? Yeah. Muckrat is saying, I will bring up earth or die trying. Now, when you got to the end of this, what is this story about? Life on earth had begun. What's this, anybody can answer this question, but what's the story about? Um, about some girl taking an opportunity to see what's down in the ocean or whatever, or from the hole. Yeah. So that's, that's the plot of the story. I think you're right. But what's the story trying to explain? Like, life on earth had begun. So this is about the creation of earth, right? Yeah. Well, it starts by saying, before this earth existed, there was only water. And the story really tells, at least in this version, how these people kind of explain how everything around us came into being. And if you look at the chat, I'm going to put this in the chat. What this is called is a creation myth. Yeah, Ray, I just saw your chat, a theory of creation. That's exactly right. I'm going to call it a creation myth for a very specific reason. Because back when this story was told, you know, first of all, almost every culture has a version of creation, right? So in the Judeo-Christian creation myth, which is a story, it's basically about how God created the earth in seven days. And you think about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And for a lot of people, and I respect everybody's religious beliefs, for a lot of people, they believe in the story. Now, when we look at a different culture's story, and we look at this one, it really kind of makes sense that an adult would want a child to understand something about the world around them. And if we think about the Native American cultures, you know, we're talking about, they didn't have libraries back then. They didn't have laboratories or geologists, you know, scientists who could look at rocks and tell you how old they were or where they came from. We didn't have astronomers to tell us about space or how stars or planets were created. So a myth is a story designed to explain the unexplainable. And I put that in the chat. I imagine that like, you know, when you were a little kid and you heard thunder and saw lightning, can you imagine how that was for people who didn't know about weather and you could imagine like a giant making big noises somewhere and a little kid going, ah! well, this kind of a story makes it simple, doesn't it? Because when you look through the story, there's not a whole lot of complicated words. Talking animals are always fun. In fact, does anyone know the word for when you give a non-human character human qualities? Like if you make a rock talk or a lamp dance or animal speak. What's that called? It's a long word, it's a money word. Does anybody know? Ray, you're close. Personification is close. This is a little bit different. I gotta spell this right. It's called anthropomorphization. I had to do my double take there. And <laughs> it's rough. So personification, Ray, you're killing me. Personification is when you basically, well, we'll save that for a different day. But anthro means people. Like anthropology is the study of human cultures. Anthropomorphization is when we give human qualities to non-human things, like in this story. But I want to come back to what I was talking about with Fabian a minute ago, because there's something super cool about this story. This story isn't really designed to be a scientific treaty about how the earth was created or even be a religious story about that. It's designed to send a message. This story has a moral. A moral is like a lesson told in a story. How many of you have uh, younger siblings? And like, does anybody have a good strategy when you want your younger brother or sister to do something? How do you get them to do it? Right. Was that? I don't know. Okay. Now, if you ride them, if you just lecture them, at some point, they're going to give you stink eye. And they're going to go, man, I don't want to. No. 
lecturing isn't a really great way to do it. You guys know how you feel when someone just says, do it because I told you so. And you're like, mm, I don't think so. So that's one strategy, but can anyone think of something more effective? <clears throat> well, sometimes we tell stories. And if you go back to that video, when I talked about how human beings do something unique that no other animal does, every animal can look at an object. Well, every animal that can see. And lots of animals can communicate about those objects using language. So if I say, oh, this is a phone. But if I say, you know, we can play a game of telephone and get a message wrong, that is something that only exists in our minds. When you tell a story like this one, we got the loon with his strong wings. We got the beaver, couldn't do it. We got the duck, couldn't do it. But look at the way the story describes the muskrat. A small voice, right? Tiny muskrat. Well, those adjectives are there on purpose. The muskrat in this story is the unlikeliest hero. What characteristic gave the muskrat the ability to get the job done? I'm asking you, what do you think? Okay, Ray, I say you put underdog in the chat. What do you mean? What's the quality of an underdog? Determined. You can see that word right here. Yes, I agree with you. When she says, and I love this because as the father of a daughter, I'm all about girl power. And when it says that she drove, she dove down, the muskrat is a she, she says, I will bring up earth or die trying. Well, that's not a person or a muskrat that I'm gonna argue with. I love that sort of will. Last week, when I asked you in the hack to school questions to ask yourself what grade you expected of yourself this semester, it was the same question. It was what are you willing to do to make something happen? Now, when I see this about muskrat, I kinda of identify with it myself. I'm the same way. In fact, if you notice, and Ray, you can say if you think that this is different, but you knew me in the classroom last year. Am I any different now than I was in the classroom last year? Oh, you seem pretty much the same as last year. Right. So on one hand, I'm still driving. I'm still a ferociously positive pain in the ass. And I love it because what's the alternative? There are so many people out there and every day when students walk into my classroom or sometimes show up on Zoom and I'll say things like, hey, how's it going? Now, I'm not blind and I'm not insensitive. I know how many problems there are right now facing all of us. But I also know how many young people I talk to every single day who when I ask that question say, oh, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. Huh, you're too young. You make your own weather system when you leave this age. So when I see someone like Muskrat, it takes me back to when I was in high school. And when I was in high school, I went to a high school that had a city championship basketball team. And I wrote the coach a letter when I was in middle school. And I said, I'm coming to the school. I'm going to try out. I'm going to make the team. Now, if you haven't noticed, I'm white. I'm also short by basketball standards. I'm barely six feet, maybe not even that anymore. I'm sitting too much. But I was on the all floorboard team. And my coach told me a saying, and I'm curious if anybody of you know this. He said, I'm going to put this in the chat. Can anybody finish this saying? How does this go? It's not the size of the fight in the dog. Damn it, I got it backwards. <laughs> I just gave it away. It's not. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. It's not the size of the dog in the fight. And then it's the size of the fight in the dog. So let's come back to this story. I'm asking you now, somebody answer this question for me. Why would a parent or a tribe elder tell this kind of a story to young people? What are they trying to get across?
Well, Fabian, what were you trying to get across when you said, no, I'm not ready to be finished. I'm going to read this till the end. Wait, as in like, what was going through my head? Yeah. I was like, let me just finish it off. Right. You and Muskrat are the same. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So when we talk about determination and resilience, well, this is a great way to start the class because this is a, basically the same lesson that the Onondaga were trying to teach their kids is the same thing that we're doing right now. You guys, just by showing up and trying to get the job done this year with everything else that's challenging you, are doing the exact same thing. So now let's look back at the agenda for today. When I ask you to post your first impression of Earth on Turtle's back and explain what you think the deeper meaning or the intention or the moral of the story, make it personal. This isn't some academic lesson that has nothing to do with you. This is about you and your life. So you can talk about the fact that this was probably a tribe creating a creation myth to give kids an idea about the world. But more importantly, it was to give the kids the idea that if they want to operate in this world in a way that'll make them successful, they're going to have to try and they're going to have to not give up. They're going to have to be stubborn and determined. Does anybody have any questions? All right, now we get to the fun part. If you are a person who has any business with me, if you need to fix your blog or set one up, Let's do that right now before we get off this call. If you're a person who wants to get to work, do that. And if you want to stay on the call, you're more than welcome to ask me any questions or chime in if you hear anything interesting. If you're a person who says, nah, I got this and I'm ready for my weekend because all of my work is done and I'm just basically a rock star who's going to dazzle Preston when he gets to the sheet. Okay, go do your own thing. Um, who owes a blog? I forgot already. You gonna make me look on the member blogs myself? Fine. Let's see. Does everybody here already have their member blog up? Okay, so Fabian and Jorge. Uh, that looks like it from the people on this call. Um, the last time when you helped me out, it had the link and everything, but I don't know why it's not there. Uh, I, w I heard that, but I didn't see who it was talking. Who was that talking? It was me, Fabian. Okay, Fabian, let me see. Yeah, I thought you did. Hmm. All right. And you sent it to my Gmail, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm not seeing it in Gmail, Fabian, so maybe I didn't get it. Uh, would you mind sending that to me again real quick? Hey, how do you do that? Um, so on your blog, just grab the URL and copy and paste it into an email. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did that last time. Hold on. That's what I thought you did. Let me see if I have it in my Outlook. Ah, it's here. Okay, my bad, Fabian. I'm going to put it in right now. All right. Now, since there's nothing on there, what you need to do is start posting, okay? Right. Can you do the same for me, too? Because I already sent you the link. Yeah, sorry I dropped the ball here. Who was that talking? Okay. George. Okay. George, I'll get to yours next, all right? Give me a second. It's one of the reasons I'm so forgiving, because once in a while I'm going to need your forgiveness. Okay, so Fabian, yours is in there now. And I got witnesses and so do you, so we should be all good there. And then George, let me find yours. George, do you remember if you sent it to my Gmail or to my school email? I don't, I'm not sure which one it was. Okay, I'll check both. All right, it's gotta be Outlook, so let me check over there.
super excited that you guys already did this. It saves us a lot of time and work. So George, for whatever reason, I don't see yours in either place. So can I ask you to please resend that, please? Yeah, I'll send it. I'll send it right now. Okay, thanks. All right, we're gonna spend the rest of the meeting zooming uh, independently and working on stuff that each one of you has separately. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording.